Okay, let's get started then. Thank you so much for coming um, today to our, oops, I'm already having feedback, um, to our annual AIUK meeting, which is our large event. So some of you come to our bi-monthly meeting, which is much smaller. And uh, so if you don't know me, I'm Michael Holmberger. I'm the Professor of Applied Dementia Research here at UEA. And we're organizing this regular series to inform you about what's happening out there in the world of dementia research. The smaller meetings which we have, which we show at the end, and you can also find out about when the next one is happening, are usually to showcase what we're doing locally. And uh, if you want to get involved in local studies or find out what we're doing in terms of local dementia research. But this annual meeting is really to showcase what people are doing out there. And we're very often getting more national speakers to showcase what people are working on in different parts of the country. So um, today we're having an order where we're talking first uh, by Robin Brisbane from Alzheimer's Research UK who are very kindly sponsoring this event and he's telling us about what Alzheimer's Research UK is doing. Then we're having, actually the order will be reversed, we're having Ian Coyle Gilchrist who's just moved uh, last year up from Cambridge to be now a new consultant of dementia here at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital. And he talks about the research he's done already in Cambridge and which ho hopefully he will expand here further. And then finally we have uh, Parish Malhotra from Imperial College London. And uh, so we're delighted to have them all here. And um, just to say in terms of schedule, we'll have a, a short break at 2.55, where there will be some tea and coffee and you have a bit of a break, uh, the, which will be after Robin and Ian's talk. Just to say fire alarms, no planned fire alarms for today. So if the fire alarm sounds, please make your way by the fire exits, which I think are two here on the front, but also at the back. And um, if you just make your way outside in front of the centre, basically. Uh, and the bathrooms are out there and at the end of the corridors. Right, we have, finally we have some feedback forms. These feedback forms are really important for us. Every year we collect them to know what's working, what's maybe not working so well, and also if you have any topic suggestions. Okay? Finally, if you're sitting right at the back, this room, we know that the acoustics can be sometimes tricky in the back. If you have any problems, please feel free to move forward and uh, then um, you can, might be able to hear much better. But without further ado, I hand over to uh, Robin, who is going to talk to us about um, the work of Alzheimer's Research UK. Over to you, Robin. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, as Michael said, my name's Robin. I'm the Science Communications Manager at Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an intro to the work that we do at ARUK. So is this feedback and intolerable, or is it okay? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the work we do at ARUK, um, go over some of the basics about um, about dementia. So I know a lot of you come to these bi-monthly meetings that I've been hearing about. So sorry if some of this is uh, going over some well-trodden ground for you, but I hope you uh, won't mind me doing that for the benefit of other people in the room. Um, yes, so uh, Alzheimer's Research UK is the UK's leading charity that focuses on biomedical research into dementia. So this means that the the donations we receive from our supporters going, go towards trying to find out more about the diseases that cause dementia and then finding new ways to um, prevent, treat and diagnose the condition. So I imagine uh, many of you who have come along to this meeting today have, have felt the impact of dementia in, in some way in your, in your personal lives. Um, so just to go over how it affects um, society, we think that 850,000 people in the UK are living with dementia. This is as much, many as 50 million internationally. We did some um, surveys last year, some, some national field work to try and find out what proportion of the population knows someone who's living with dementia, and it seems to us that one in two people have a close friend or family member who has had the condition. 
And as well as the, the individual impact and the impact dementia has on families, there's also a very big financial impact. So dementia and the cost associated with caring for people with dementia um, impacts the, the economy to the tune of 26 billion pounds a year, which is more than cancer and heart disease um, combined. But despite this uh, enormous um, personal and financial impact, around six times more is spent on cancer research than it is on dementia research. And obviously, cancer research is extremely important, um, but we, we, we want to sort of get to a, a parity with dementia research funding, considering the impact that the condition has. So what is dementia? So most people will think of dementia as, as some, some sort of memory loss, uh, but it's a word we give to a group of symptoms that can include memory loss, but also um, includes things like personality changes, uh, communication difficulties, reasoning problems, and these symptoms get worse over time and affect the way that people um, can go about their day-to-day -day lives. And dementia is caused by diseases. And these are the names of the most common diseases that cause dementia. Um, Alzheimer's disease there is the most common, accounting for about two-thirds of um, dementia cases. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but there are other forms like vascular dementia, which is to do with the, the um, blood vessels in the, in the brain not, not supplying blood in the way that it normally does. Alzheimer's and vascular dementia can often occur together, um, and then people are diagnosed with mixed dementia. Um, there's also dementia with Lewy bodies. It affects about 100,000 people in the UK. Um, some of the symptoms are, are closely associated with Parkinson's disease. Frontotemporal dementia, which tends to affect younger people, um, causing memory prob um, sorry, communication problems and behavioral changes. Um, Parkinson's disease can lead to dementia. And then there are also rarer forms as well. So what all these diseases have in common, even though there's different chemical processes underway in the brain, is that they all um, damage nerve cells in the brain and the connection between nerve cells in the brain. Um, so during the course of these diseases, more and more nerve cells become damaged and the brain actually starts to physically shrink. Um, and these changes that, are, that occur in the brain can happen maybe 20 years before, can start to happen maybe 20 years before symptoms start to show. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, we know that um, the damage is associated with these two uh, proteins, amyloid and tau, but each of the diseases has different um, characteristics. So these processes can get underway maybe 20 years before symptoms start to show, but at the moment people can only be re really be diagnosed when they start to display these symptoms. And the, the symptoms can overlap between one form of dementia and another, so it's very difficult for doctors to give people uh, a definitive diagnosis of the disease that's causing their symptoms. So one of the things we want to do is improve the accuracy and the timeliness of diagnosis. We also know there are lifestyle factors that can affect our risk of dementia. So maybe 30% um, of dementia cases might be attributable to um, lifestyle and, and other health factors, whereas um, 60 to 80% might be down to our genetic makeup. Um, but these are the things that a doctor would recommend in order to keep our risk of dementia as low as possible. And what you'll notice is that many of these things are similar to what a doctor would tell you to do to reduce your risk of heart disease. So in general terms, what good, what's good for your heart also tends to be uh, good for your head. Now, of course, what we're, what we're really after is new treatments for dementia. Now, there are some treatments that might be prescribed to people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies to, to treat some of the symptoms. And what these uh, treatments do is boost the levels of, of a chemical messenger in the brain so that nerve cells in the brain can communicate better with one another. 
Now, unfortunately, this doesn't stop the damage from occurring. It just helps to compensate for some of that damage for a certain period of time, maybe about a year, 18 months. These treatments don't work for everyone, but they can have, they have important benefits to many people. A key thing that we want to do is to develop um, treatments that are disease modifying, that will help protect nerve cells from the damaging processes. So overall, we want to um, understand diseases like Alzheimer's better, find more effective ways that we can all reduce our risk of dementia, we want to be able to diagnose people earlier and more accurately, and of course, we want to develop new treatments. So ARUK's work spans the whole process from scientific ideas that people have in the lab, we follow those through with careful analysis, we have um, drug discovery institutes that are working to develop new um, drugs that could potentially tackle these disease processes. We follow that research up um, in people looking at things like brain scans, we want to get new drugs into clinical trials involving people, and then eventually um, treatments in the hands of patients. So we do this by funding research right around the UK and increasingly internationally. We've got these 15 regional network centres where we encourage scientists to work together. We provide funding for them to um, generate preliminary data to kickstart new research studies and also to put on events like this to try and raise awareness of dementia. Now, I work in the communications team at ARUK, and uh, one of the things that we do is to try and um, ensure that dementia research is covered um, responsibly in the press. And uh, yeah, I think we're we've still got some work to do, we've still got some way to go. Uh, but whenever these stories come out, we try and provide a comment that puts the research into some sort of context and um, yeah, tries to analyze what the, paper, what the uh, study might be really telling us rather than sometimes the uh, slightly sensational headlines that we, uh, that we see most weeks. <coughs> We've got a, a range of other resources on our website, alzheimersresearchuk.org. We have a blog, we have information about different forms of dementia and um, all the latest dementia research news. We also have this service called the Dementia Research Info Line. So this is um, a sort of help desk service that you can call and put your questions to our information officers. If you've seen something about dementia research and you want to know more, you can give them a call or you can email them and they'll be very happy to answer your questions. The team also produced these information leaflets. We've brought a selection along here today. Um, if you would like more of these for your workplace or um, anything like that, then please come and talk to us and we can ship these out for, for free to you. And um, the, our help desk also supports this service called Join Dementia Research, which is um, a sort of research register, so you can sign up to let people know that you're interested in taking part in dementia research studies. So a lot of the research that we fund really relies on volunteers who take part. Um, so if you're interested in joint dementia research, taking part in studies, then please um, either Google joint dementia research or contact our dementia research info line. <coughs> Finally, as well as our um, research work and our communications work, we also have an important policy and public affairs function. So trying to make sure that dementia stays at the top of the political agenda, so we can get more government funding for research. And we've um, had this campaign called Just 1%, where we're trying to get the government to invest 1% of the final financial impact of dementia into dementia research. Okay, and finally, none of the work that we do would be possible without um, our supporters who are incredibly generous and dedicated to um, finding new ways to help people with dementia. They do all sorts of incredible things to raise money for us. 
We were partners in the London Marathon this year. Over 2,000 um, runners um, were running for our Dementia Revolution campaign. Okay, now I'm going to pass you over to Ian. Um, thank you very much. There won't be an opportunity for questions at the end, but thank you. Excellent. Well, I'm not Ian, but uh, I'm just introducing Ian. And uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Ian called Gilchrist, uh, who has said I know for actually several years already, and uh, it's our time in Cambridge. So it's a great pleasure to have you here now with us at the hospital and to hear about your research in apathy in dementia. Over to you. Okay. Yes. Probably easier, yeah. yeah. And the lapel is off. Brilliant. Hello. Um, so I, I'm one of the consultant neurologists at the Norfolk and Norwich. Um, before that, I was a, a registrar and a research fellow in, in Cambridge. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about apathy in dementia and, and why I think it's important. Well, here is why I think it's important. Because it's common. Probably about half of people with Alzheimer's have apathy at any one time, 90% over the course of their illness. It's disabling, so when we see apathy, we know it's associated with higher levels of disability. It's distressing, and that's not just for the person with dementia, but for the people around them. And apathy very strongly correlates with carer distress. And partly for that reason, but not only, it's also associated with higher care costs. It's a risk for going into institutionalized care, and probably a worse prognosis overall as well. And so for all of those reasons, I think it's a very attractive target for treatment. And there's been a range of different things looking and trials looking to treat apathy with drugs and with other things. And the results of those have been rather contradictory and overall a little bit disappointing. And I'd like to talk to you about why I think that is and what I think we can do to get around it. Um, I'm going to show you some data. Um, it's going to be mostly from the PIPIN study, which came out of Cambridge but was in collaboration with Norfolk and the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital as well. Uh, PIPIN stands for PICS Disease and Progressive Supranuclear Palsy Prevalence and Incident Study, which probably tells you more about the sorts of people who named these than the, <laughs> the study itself. Um, this was a, a large study, and it was looking at people who have something called frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Now, that's another one of these umbrella terms. It encompasses frontotemporal dementia, which is one of the commonest forms of dementia before retirement age and gets even more common as we get older, and then progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobigital degeneration. And these are all uh, characterised by progressive changes in language, in behaviour and in movement. And that's in association with shrinkage of the, of the frontal lobes, you can see lit up there, and the, the temporal lobes in the brain, which are those bits there. And the reason that we use these disorders to study apathy is because in these, apathy is particularly severe, very common, and occurs very early on. So we have the opportunity to study apathy in a relatively pure form. Now, Alzheimer's, dementia with Lewy body, they also affect the frontal and the temporal lobes, but at a later stage. And in FTLD, we have the opportunity to look at apathy early in the illness. So, how do you treat apathy? And this is the way that most trials and studies have gone so far. You, you measure it, then you treat it with your drug or whatever it may be, and then you measure it again and see whether it's had a benefit or not. So how do you measure apathy? And well, the obvious answer is you ask somebody, how do you feel? And so this is an example of doing that. This is somebody I met who had frontotemporal dementia. And what we did was we asked her, can you mark on the line on the scale going from not at all all the way through to extremely, how interested are you right now? And she, what she's done is she's drawn a box around the word extremely. And so we said, well, that's not quite what we meant. If you could mark on the scale, put a mark on it to show us how, how excited you are now. And she's like a school teacher. She's marked it with a tick. 
And I said, well, thanks, but no. Um, if you put a line through the scale to show me. And so she's put a line through the word extremely. And we've tried again with tired, and she's gone back to not at all. And then we've tried again with stimulated, and this time she's marked the word extremely. And then finally we've tried with bored, and she tried marking, and said, no, not quite. Put a line through, not at all. No, that's, again, put a line through to show me how you're feeling right now. And she's put two lines through the word extremely to say that's definitely not that. And this is a lady who's early on in her illness. She's still managing her own finances. She's not driving, but she booked the taxi to come and see me, paid for it herself, independent living. And this is not severe dementia in the normal concept, but she has great difficulty with understanding and completing this task in a way that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. So what I'm trying to get across is if we are asking people with brain diseases to report how they're feeling, we have to understand that they will respond in ways that we're not necessarily anticipating and can be quite difficult to predict. So there's an alternative approach, which is ask somebody else. And so this is something that we've done. This is some data looking at uh, about 100 people with, um, with FTLD. And we've, we've asked them to complete something called the Apathy Evaluation Scale. Well, that's a questionnaire which asks you about particular symptoms that relate to apathy. And our, our patients with FTLD, uh, that's the red column, they report high levels of symptoms, more so than, than healthy people of a, a similar sort of age, that's the blue column. So they are reporting apathetic symptoms. You can ask the same set of questions, but ask for a carer, somebody who knows them well, normally a spouse. And they, again, they report the same set of symptoms, they're reporting increased levels of apathy, and that's fine. And there's a third version of this, which is something I complete, which is combining what the person with dementia is telling me along with my observations of what they're saying. And all three charts look similar. In each case, we're seeing higher levels of apathy compared with healthy controls. If you then do some statistics on this, you'll see there's good, positive, significant correlations between what the patient is saying and what I'm recording on my assessment. There's good, easy, significant correlations between what I'm recording and what the carers, their spouses, are saying. But these don't correlate with each other. And so what that's saying is that the patient is reporting apathy and apathetic symptoms. Their spouse or their carer is reporting apathy and apathetic symptoms, but they're not reporting the same symptoms at the same time. And what I'm trying to get across here is that when you're assessing something like apathy, assessors disagree and don't necessarily report as we're expecting. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. One of the things that's often suggested is that the person with dementia lacks insight or has problems identifying their emotional state. Well, that might be true, but also we're seeing that the people with dementia are reporting apathy and apathetic symptoms. So it can't be the whole answer. And similarly, people say that other people might be making the wrong assumptions. You can see there, there's a little cartoon saying, it's not apathy, it's Botox. Lack of facial expression we see in dementia doesn't necessarily mean you're not feeling underneath it. And I think the other thing that this is telling us is that the ways that we normally measure things like apathy are not necessarily objective. And also these tools, which were devised and designed using healthy, apparently normal American students... Um, and then being converted for use in psychiatry, how we apply that in brain diseases is not necessarily as clear as we might have thought. The other thing I wanted to point out, is going back to my example patient, is if you look, what she has done is she's gone for the extremes on each emotion. It's either extremely or not at all. There's no consideration of the middle ground. And... The next thing I did after we'd completed this was I said, well, look, can you draw me what a, a bored face looks like or what a tired face, sad, angry? And how about somebody who's interested, happy or excited? Now, I would suggest to you that apart from the hairstyles, the sad faces don't look very different and the happy faces don't look very different. What I think has happened is that she has lost the subtleties in between these emotions and it's become very much all or nothing. And if that's the case, that's very important when we study emotional states and motivational states like apathy. 
Now, that's not research. That's an example. But we have done research on these sorts of things. These are people with progressive supranuclear palsy. And they have great difficulty recognising facial expressions uh, and emotional in the face of other people. So the people with PSP are, are the black lines there. And you can see they're getting less facial recognition right compared with healthy controls. And that's been done in a range of different forms of dementia. What we know in PSP is that that does relate to structural changes within the brain and it relates to areas within the frontal lobes. Now, so far, you might have noticed I, I, I've dodged trying to define what apathy is. And, of course, we all have an idea that loss of spark, less motivation, less get up and go. is actually quite a difficult thing to define. Um, I would suggest that a good definition is it's a reduction in goal-directed thinking, goal-directed cognition. And if you think about what I mean by that, well, that's the idea of having an idea and then planning it out, being motivated to do it, weighing up the pros and cons, then actually how you're going to do it, then doing it, and then evaluating the outcome. It's more than one thing. And so it's not surprising that more than one thing area of the brain can lead to apathy. And here is an even worse slide. And please don't try and read all of this, but this is a reminder for me uh, to say that we know from people who've had strokes, we know from animal models, we know from functional brain imaging, that damage and changes within different areas of the brain can affect different things that lead to apathy. So in the blue, there's changes in the way that we process emotions, changes in the way that we're able to plan Changes in auto-activation, that's generating the idea in the first place, can all lead to decreased goal-directed cognition. But then on the other side, which hasn't quite come across in the slide perfectly, on red, is saying that also other areas of the brain that are involved in language, in movement, in emotional distress, they can make it harder to do things. And so you need more motivation to do it and they can reduce the amount of motivation you have. Now, that's not a reduction in goal-directed cognition. That's not apathy as I would think about it, but it can lead to the same symptoms. And then if we're relying on, on you to tell us about the symptoms, we also have to accept that that comes with your own ideas, impressions, and your own emotional state. And all of those can feed in and affect the reported symptoms. So... If we want to try and test our treatments, if we want to look and understand what's going on in the brain in more detail, we need to identify these problematic symptoms, apathetic behaviour, but we need then to find objective ways of measuring the underlying cognitive processes that are going on. And there are a range of different ways that we do this. Here is one example, which is a, a phenomenally boring test where you, you sit in front of a computer with arrows pointing left and right and left and right, and you press a button left and right as quick as you can until you hear a beep that tells you to stop. And what we can do is vary the time between seeing the arrow and hearing the beep. And by doing that, we can get a measure of how well you're able to inhibit an action. So it's part of the processing that we use in our goal-directed behaviour. And that's one example, and there are a range of other computerised and automated tests we can use to measure aspects of decision-making, goal-directed cognition behaviour. And if we do that, these are some graphs showing you uh, from the Pippin study, patients and, and healthy controls, and we see that they perform differently on these tests across a range of different measures. And that's, that's reassuring. We'd expect to see that. It's more difficult to explain this, which is then when we take this patient group who are performing differently and we split them up and say, well, if you're carers are telling us you're apathetic or you're not, is there a difference on these tests? And at a sort of group level, the answer is no. There aren't significant differences. Now, that's not a fault with the methods. It doesn't mean that these tests aren't working. And nor does it mean what the carers are telling us is wrong. But it's telling us that each measure in isolation isn't enough to capture and encompass the entire thing. And that's exactly what you'd expect, based on what I've told you so far, in that decision-making in goal-directed cognition is more than one thing. We're expecting multiple things to get disrupted at the same time. And so one isolated measure isn't going to capture the whole thing. 
What I would suggest that means is that as opposed to just relying on subjective reports, on interviews, on questionnaires, and instead of just relying on individual points of goal-directed cognition of behaviour, we need to use both together. And we need to have a multifaceted and a multimodal way of assessing and measuring apathy. And that's something that we've done. You can combine these multi-measures together, and then you can apply statistical models on it and use the outcomes of that to find common themes that underpin apathy. And then we can relate that across to well, biomarkers, brain imaging. So that's me without a beard and without hair. And they can slice me up and look in my brain. And we can do that with people who've gone through these measures as well. And this is work by Claire Lansdor a couple of years ago. And she did exactly that. Large group of people with frontal temporal lobe degeneration, a whole range of different ways of measuring apathy, and then putting it into a statistical model, finding the common themes that underlie that, and then looking at how they relate to the brain. And what she found is there are distinct areas of the brain that each relate to distinct areas of apathy. And for the first time, she's able to unpick those and identify them. That's very powerful in itself, but it shows us more than that, because she's then gone on and said, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for the patients? And she's shown, as I told you in my first slide, apathy has prognostic implications, but not all apathy is the same. And so some of these underlying core factors strongly predict a worse prognosis. Others do not. And so now we have a much more focused and targeted way of looking and understanding how apathy is working. So in my last few slides, I thought I'd talk about treatment and treatment of apathy as we understand it at the moment. Now, I would suggest to you all that it's not one size fits all. And when people come to me and say, well, my husband or I am apathetic, what I want to know is, what do you mean? I well remember the time they said, well, every time I cook a delicious meal, he only eats half of it. And what was actually happening was he couldn't see half the plate, and if you turn it round, eats the other half. It's important to work out what they mean when they say apathy. Why does somebody appear to be apathetic? What effect does it have? And why is it a problem? And who is it a problem for? If the problem is not that the patient feels fine, but the people around them are getting very distressed, the way that you explain and the way that you target your treatment is going to be different. Explanation, I think, is the most useful aspect of this. This is not laziness. It's not your fault. Trying to break tasks down into small, manageable chunks and also pick your battles. Decide what you need to do and what you want to do and find the meaningful things that you enjoy. And there is a fine line but a clear difference between gentle prompting and encouragement and nagging, which doesn't help. And then similarly, if you are looking after somebody with dementia, one of the most effective treatments is to look after yourself and keep yourself well. There is, I think, a limited role for medication. And so some of the drugs that we use in, for example, Alzheimer's disease might be helpful in some forms of apathy. I look very hard for depression, and if I find depression, I treat it, but I don't treat apathy with antidepressants. And the other medication that have been proposed, some of the stimulant medications, for example, they all need further research. I would suggest the way of researching, the way of investigating these other medications is exactly what I've shown you today, which is split apathy, a big, broad, rather subjective term, down into objective, measurable chunks, relate those back to the brain itself, not just to the anatomy, but the underlying chemistry. And in doing that, we then have a target for our treatments and a way of measuring whether they're working. Um, lots of people have worked on this. Um, down the left column are the people who have directly worked on the Pippin study itself, and down the right-hand side are a lot of other people who have been enormously helpful along the way, and in particular the, the bottom right, which is our patients and volunteers. And I think these slides are going online. If people want to read more of the basic science, there are a load of re references there. Thank you. Great. Fantastic.
fantastic. Well, we have some time for questions now. So, if you have any questions, we have some roving mics, I think, yeah, at the side. So if you have, please raise your hand so everybody can hear your question. Do we have any questions? Maybe I kick us off then with one question. Mm. One thing I'm always worried about with apathy is that I wonder how people were before they had the disease. Mm. Did some people already were not as motivated? Yes. <laughs> if I think about myself taking out the bin or anything like that, I'm less motivated. So how do you take that into account, how motivated Yeah, uh, it, it's very difficult. So in clinical practice, I think it is it's really important. I well remember somebody coming enormously distressed because her husband was very, very apathetic. And she told me all he does is sit in front of the TV every day. And I said, well, how was he before he got ill? Uh, and the answer was, well, he just sat in front of the TV all day. Um, and actually there, the important thing there is not that they're telling the wrong thing, but actually what they're using is apathy as a way of exhibiting their own distress at the situation they found themselves in. And the problem wasn't the apathy itself. The problem was the fact that they're going through a horrendous time. In terms of basic research into apathy, it's difficult. One of the ways you can get around this, of course, is by having, like we have, big numbers of people and having a large group so that you hope those sort of pre-morbid, before the illness differences are, uh, are taken out. But also, I suggest that those are not necessarily irrelevant here. And that how we are before we get dementia probably does have an effect on what our dementia is like later on. And that's not something we should completely cancel out. It's something which is important. The advantage of this kind of work is that it doesn't come with any preconceived ideas and we can split things apart and we can just look for common themes. And when we find that, the key then is having other things. So that's like the biomarkers, like the brain imaging, but also genetics and chemical signatures. And we can use those to try and investigate the results of our statistical analysis. We go in with no assumption and then we explore what we find at the end. Hi, Ian. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, very interested, as you know, in initiation for activities in daily life. And one of the challenges I find when we're interviewing the family members, it's sometimes when it's not clear whether the person is not starting an activity because they are pathetic, lack motivation, or whether they forgot the, to, do the, to start the task. So how would you address, what's your suggestion to try and to untangle this, you know, the neural basis can be a little bit... Complex. Yeah, I think you're right to say that it's complicated and each individual is going to be different and people can appear apathetic for lots of different reasons. Um, in terms of how we address that in the clinic, well, the way is then looking at how things are being introduced, what's happening, how they're trying to do tasks in the first place. And if, if you say to somebody, right, uh, I'm going out and when I'm out, could you do this, do this, do this, uh, it's not going to work. On the other hand, if you have small, manageable chunks, individual things, and you've reinforced that with prompts, with written lists, things that are understandable, and you've tested that that works, that's a much better way of approaching it. Um, I think the sort of the auto-activation that we're talking about, that spark to actually start doing things, when we see that, certainly in the clinical syndromes that I, I spend my time looking at, I think it's really quite marked and really quite dramatic in the forms that I see. So um, I'm always struck by the fact that people with progressive supranuclear palsy, if I ask them a question, you will hear nothing back for almost an embarrassingly long period of time, just to the point where I'm about to interrupt and ask the question again. And then they answer. And so what that's showing me is that they're having great difficulty in getting the neural activity to stimulate and have that response in the first place. If you spot that, it's really key then to give people time. Even if you feel uncomfortable that moment, wait, 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 it's coming. If you jump in and ask the question again, then you go back to the start, and you can spend the whole day interrupting just before you get the answer. It's a lovely talk. Thanks for uh, 
going through it all so clearly. But I just wanted to ask, so in some dementias, you get variation of symptoms during the day. And has anybody ever looked at whether apathy can vary during the day or motivation changes? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I, I'm not immediately aware of a study that I can bring to mind. Um, one of the interesting aspects of that, of course, is that almost all of the studies that look at that sort of thing, if you're making multiple measures of apathy throughout the day, then you're going to have to use a very quick screen. And I've shown you why that's not going to work. And also we have the confounding aspects there of if you're tired, you need more motivation. It's not that you're more apathetic, it's that you need more motivation to do it. So you're going to have changes in rhythms during the day as well. Thank you. You've raised a very interesting point about the difference between the carer's attitude to apathy and the patient's attitude. I'm just wondering how much research in general, not just in terms of apathy, concentrates on the carers as opposed to the patients. That's a very good question. I think there's nobody here who would say there's been enough research in either aspect of this. Um, and there is research looking at how carers' attitudes and also how they were before dementia came into the relationship affects how symptoms are reported, and there is an influence there. But also there is a, a degree of research showing that particular symptoms and particular forms of dementia have different effects on carers. And of course that's, that's to be expected. If people are behaving differently in the relationship, it is going to have a different impact on you. Um, there's some work, but not enough, looking at how if we help with the carers and help work with them to work with the person with dementia, it can have an inf impact and effect on the levels of apathy that are reported. But all of this research, certainly when we talk about apathy, is compounded and confounded by the problem that the way that we measure apathy is a bit too simplistic, and this is a much more complicated subject than we appreciated before. Yeah, I think this is the big challenge, isn't it? Mm. Because you measure somewhat an absence of something, not that there's something additional there. Yeah, it's very difficult to, uh, to measure something that somebody's not doing. Measure an absence, exactly. And try recruiting for a study on apathy. It's a, <laughs> a real challenge. <laughs> yeah, the people who don't come forward. Very <laughs> mm. Any other questions we're having for Ian? Yes, please, over there. Um, you said um, if you're working with someone and you think there might be depression, you would treat the depression rather than treat the apathy with antidepressants. Mm. What features are you looking for specifically that would make you think depression rather than apathy? Um, so I suppose, and you, I, I wouldn't be thinking depression rather than apathy, but I know depression and apathy go hand in hand. When I think about depression, certainly in terms of depression and dementia, I'm looking for active negative emotional states. I'm not looking for the absence of emotion. I'm looking for people who feel bad. And sometimes, certainly in the front of temporal dementias, and that's the, the lady who is having great difficulty completing my little scales, abstract terms and sort of really trying to understand and explore their emotions in the way that we're all trained to do with big open questions doesn't work so well. And I tend to take quite a blunt approach and say, how are you feeling? Do you feel sad? And the people who feel sad will tell you and that is an indicator that there may be depression going on. Somebody who doesn't feel sad, who also doesn't feel happy, isn't necessarily depressed. And we know that those people, antidepressants are less likely to be helpful. Um, we know that if you treat apathy in isolation with antidepressants, there's no good evidence that that works and there's some bad evidence that it might be actively um, harmful in terms of making the apathy worse. But we also know, even in dementia, if you have active negative emotional states and depression, antidepressants can still be effective. Right, so if we don't have any further questions, um, we're having now a short break, and I think Ian needs to leave pretty soon, but if you
he would have been shy in the big audience. You might come down to talk to him or talk a brief over coffee. But if you'd be back by uh, 20 past three, actually, let's make it a bit shorter, then we're, we're having more time for later. So if you find yourself outside for coffee and tea, and we just thank Ian Valentine for his talk. Thank you very much. Um, Harash is a, a reader at Imperial College, and at the same time, he's a consultant also at the Hammersmith and Charing Cross Hospital. Charing Cross Hospital. I always forget the second part. Um, so we're delighted to have him here, and he's talking today about diagnosing dementia, PET scans, lumbar punctures, and pitfalls. Over to you, Parash. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you all very much for having me. Um, so I just thought I'd start by telling you what I do on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and then go into what I'm going to talk about. So I'm 50%, 50%. So my 50% of research is understanding how thinking, particularly memory, attention, and concentration are affected by diseases of the brain. I started off mainly in stroke and seeing how that affected attention. And then over the last 10 years or so, I've done more work in dementia. And of course, well, I hope, of course, uh, part of this is trying to develop new treatments for people who have thinking problems and attention problems. And then I also am a clinician, so I'm a consultant, and every Monday morning I do what is called a cognitive neurology or a memory clinic or a dementia clinic, and the work there consists of making a diagnosis in people with possible or suspected dementia or cognitive impairments, and again, to start treatments and potentially uh, refer people to appropriate research so that they can take part in that. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm very excited about because it's at the interface between the two. It's where the research meets the clinical work and trying to see how we make a diagnosis and understanding that process and what new techniques have become available in the last 10, 15, 20 years that have changed that process. And I've put pitfalls in the talk on purpose because I know that Often when people talk uh, to other researchers or to clinicians or to, uh, I was about to say patients, but people and living with dementia and their families, they're evangelists. And they want to say how good the new technique is and how perfect it is and how brilliant it is, etc., etc. I will try to be as honest with you as I can be about what these t tests mean, how we interpret them in clinic, and the pitfalls associated with each of them. None of these things is perfect. A lot of what I say now will not be true in 10 years' time because things will have moved on, but this is how I understand it at the moment. So, what do we do? We've already heard from Robin about diagnoses and what caused dementia. So we have these conditions on the left-hand side, which are really neurodegenerative diseases, diseases that cause the brain to shrink. Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, what was described as frontotemporal lobar degeneration in the last talk, cerebrovascular disease and stroke, Lewy body disease, Huntington's disease, and then CJD, which we've heard, heard a lot about in the news 20, 30 years ago. Then all these other things on the right can also mimic dementia. So if someone has enough head injuries, some people with HIV or AIDS or other infections, people with autoimmune disease of the brain, all of these things can also cause cognitive impairment and dementia and need to be ruled out in the clinic before we start saying this is a brain shrinking condition, this is a neurodegenerative disease. And really, Alzheimer's disease is the most common of these, the most common neurodegenerative condition that causes dementia. And that's what we're often trying to rule in or rule out. It's the most uh, frequently occurring and most likely condition to be causing dementia in old age and in younger people. And we do this in a very, very old-fashioned way in the majority of cases. We talk to the patient, and then we talk to their spouse, their carer, their family and friends. And what we're trying to find out is, is there anything that this person used to do that they cannot do now because their thinking is affected? That's my approach, and that's as simple as it gets. So what could they do before that they cannot do now? In someone who's, sti who's still working, can they still do everything at work? 
If it's someone who's picking up their grandchildren from school, are they still able to do that? Can they still follow the person around? Can they remember that it's that time to go and pick them up? Have they forgotten at all? It's these things. It's about the individual and what they do. So it's much more personalised than doing a scan or a blood test. It's about knowing that person, knowing what they could do before, and really, it's critical that we speak to a family member. So if someone comes on their own to clinic, often one of the most important things that I'll do is take the phone number of their uh, family member, whether it's their partner or someone else, and have a 15, 20 minute conversation with them to ask what's been happening, what's changed. And that change is critical. And then we have an examination, perhaps some memory tests, a neurological examination, see if there's any weakness, any signs of stroke, any problems with vision or eye movement. And then last, we come to the fancy investigations, which is what everybody likes to talk about. So these are the add-on, the thing that comes on the end. They're not the real presentation or the key to making the diagnosis. They're something that help us, and that should always be remembered, that it's a tool. It's not the be-all and end-all. And in straightforward cases, the imaging can help confirm the clinical suspicion. So if we think it's Alzheimer's disease, We'll, it'll help us uh, confirm that, but they can all, it can also rule out other conditions that could be causing these symptoms. And so this is a CT scan, which is basically uh, a technique using x-rays. So we get a, a slice through the brain, and it's a slice like this at the top of someone's head. This is all brain tissue. Can you see that all right? Can you make out the slide? Just about. Can you see that white rim there? So this is the very bright bit of the skull, and can you see that white rim there between brain and skull? Can everyone see that? So that's blood. So this person, ah, thank you very much. This person has had a brain hemorrhage, and it's that hemorrhage that's causing their cognitive problems. So rather than this being a scan to tell us that someone has Alzheimer's or not, it's something we can do rapidly, and we see that the patient has a hemorrhage, and then we can deal with this uh, with surgery or not, depending on whether it's required. But in this case, the imaging has ruled out other conditions. We were thinking it might be a neurodegenerative condition, but it actually turned out to be a hemorrhage. So what do we do to diagnose? So the clinical assessment is what I mentioned. What we, so the sort of thing we can do in clinic is something like this, where there are tests of memory, attention, what we call uh, executive function, and language, and then you get a score out of 30. This is the Montreal um, cognitive assessment, and the most famous person to have taken this is this man here, who says that he got full marks, and I'm not going to make any further comment about that whatsoever. <laughs> but this is, oh sorry, this is something that can be done in clinic, so the person doesn't need to come back to the hospital, it's something that takes really 10 or 15 minutes, no more, but it's a crude tool to say that, well, yeah, uh, it's, a crude, it's a crude business anyway. What we can do is something much more thorough, so we can invite someone back and they can spend two or three hours doing memory tests, attentional tests, cognitive tests. And that's formal neuropsychological testing. Um, but it does require someone to come back. And then we can do imaging, in particular MRI scans. And until, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, the other key thing was time. So we'd wait. And often, still really sometimes, at the end of a clinic appointment we'd say, well, let's see, I'll see you again in six months, I'll see you again in nine months, I'll see you again in 12 months, I'll see you again when I've got another appointment, and then we'll see if things have changed. And time is very, very important, and one of the things that I'm going to go through again and again in this talk is the importance of time and more than one measurement at more than one time point. So having a single snapshot, whether it's neuropsychology or an MRI scan, is not always enough. More recently, we can take fluid from someone's spine, or we can do types of PET scan, and that gives us a better idea of the underlying cause of someone's uh, dementia or cognitive impairment. So, just to go through the things we've discussed. Neuropsychology is often pen and paper testing. It can involve different domains of cognition, so memory, attention, decision-making, and going through all these. It's not too expensive, but it is time-consuming. It can be done in someone's home. It doesn't have to be done in a scanner, but it takes ages. You know, it's quite a long time. 
also is very much affected by culture and education. So you have to have norms for each test. What should that person be getting, given that they were educated for this many years and they've been brought up with this as their first language? So there's lots of comparisons that you have to make. You don't get a straightforward, straight-out answer. It doesn't always tell us what the underlying condition is. It tells us that someone has problems. So again, it's a single snapshot in time. It can never be totally definitive. MRI scans. So these are the things that we show pictures of all the time. Some people will read reports of MRI scans. Some people will look at pictures of MRI scans. But what's important to know, and this is what I say to uh, people in clinic, and you're welcome to pick me up on it after we finish, but our brains are like our skin. So our brains do not look the same at 50 as they did at 20 as they did at 10. It's the same. We pick up blemishes. The structure of our skin is not the same. And we can see the same when we look at brain scans. And also, to be honest, if someone has smoked 30 a day and drunk a bottle of vodka a day, you can often see that in their skin. And the same thing occurs with the brain as well. You can see those changes when you look at brain scans. So it's not a clear-cut thing that the brain has shrunk or it hasn't, because you might have all these other factors come into play. So this is a 25-year-old brain, and when people talk about Alzheimer's normally, they talk about these structures here, the hippocampi, which are related to memory, and in typical Alzheimer's, in a typical scan, we'd expect them to shrink. But, remember, this is a 25-year-old's brain, so this is the white matter, which is mainly made up of fibres, like cables, taken from one nerve cell to another. This is the grey matter. These black areas are the cerebrospinal fluid, which bathes the brain. And this is a 67-year-old's brain. And I think you should all be able to see that there's a bit more fluid in the 67-year-old's brain bathing it. And the, the brain is smaller. Its shape is slightly different. And the hippocampi are a bit smaller as well. Can you all see that there's a subtle difference between the 67-year-old's brain and the 25-year-old? It's not massive, but it has changed over time. It's not quite the same thing. And then we, if we look at a 67-year-old with Alzheimer's, the gaps between where the fluid are are much bigger. There's been degeneration so that there's more fluid and less brain throughout the brain here, and the hippocampi are much, much smaller. Can you all see that? So it's, it's not that Alzheimer's is an extension of aging, but all I'm trying to say is the brain changes with aging, and it changes in different ways and more with these neurodegenerative conditions, these brain shrinking conditions. And that's important to keep in mind. None of these things is quite as absolute as we might say it is. So, MRI scans are high resolution. You could see how beautiful those pictures of the brain were. They can show us the volume of structures like the hippocampus. So if you do MRIs year after year, you can measure in millilitres the volume going down in someone who has Alzheimer's. You can see that there's neurodegeneration. But it doesn't tell us what's causing the problem. Robin mentioned those two substances, those two proteins, amyloid and tau. And MRI scans don't show us those things. Also, the MRI scans don't always show us the typical changes. If patients are younger, or if they have a different sort of presentation, if they don't have the typical memory loss that we see in typical Alzheimer's disease, the MRI scan doesn't change in typical ways. And as I've said before now, it's a single snapshot of a process that takes place over time. So one MRI scan on its own doesn't always give the answer. And if it doesn't fit with the clinical picture, with how someone has been, then you should be very wary of the scan rather than of the patient's story or their family's story. Then this is another type of test called a PET scan. So I'm going to talk about PET scans more later, but I wanted to tell you about this type of PET scan first. So this is what's called an FDG PET scan. But all that means really is it's using glucose and it's looking at brain metabolism and which bits of brain are active and which bits aren't. And you can use this type of PET scan to look at the whole body because if you inject this substance, FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, 
It's a radioactive chemical that's very similar to glucose, and it will go to parts of the body or brain that are very metabolically active. So if you're looking at the rest of the body, you might be looking for something like cancer, a hidden cancer, which is very active, and you can see the activity on the scan, whether it's in the stomach or in the chest or wherever, and standard scans might not pick that up. But if we use it in the brain, it shows us bits of brain that aren't active, that aren't as active as they should be. And this is very sensitive for early neurodegenerative disease. So before there's any shrinking, parts of the brain start to become underactive. And we can see that in PET scans like this by looking at metabolism. So looking at which bits are taking up glucose at high speed and which bits aren't. But again, this doesn't tell us about the proteins that are causing the problem. It doesn't tell us about the hallmark proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease or any of the other conditions I mentioned. And I've sort of skirted around the fact, but just to stress again, these scans are on the whole interpreted by specialists who give an opinion. And that opinion is based on their interpretation of the scan. If there's a bit of shrinkage, if these changes aren't as obvious, they have to hedge their bets slightly. It's not always a clear cut, yes, this is abnormal, no, this isn't. It's much more of a, there could be some abnormality here, but not sure, maybe scan again in a year's time. So all these things are an opinion, and I'm not, that's not to denigrate my colleagues, it's just to let you know that these aren't numbers, these aren't yeses and nos, but much more nuanced statements about what can be seen or what can't on the scan. So, I've mentioned those proteins, amyloid and tau, more than once. So this is amyloid, which accumulates outside cells in plaques that are about the thickness of a sheet of paper. And this is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, along with these tau tangles, which are within cells, within, within neurons. And from the evidence that we have to date, it appears that amyloid comes first in the brain and then is followed by tau. So if we can detect these things in people who are alive, then we should be able to have a surrogate for what happens when we look at tissue under the microscope after people have died. So Robin mentioned that the only way we can diagnose absolutely Alzheimer's disease is with post-mortem tissue, but if we can have an indication that these things are there in life, then at least that gets us closer. And so the first of these things is doing a lumbar puncture. So when I first gave this talk, my wife told me, you can't put that picture in and you can't show this. And I said that I'll try, and I've been all right so far, but for anybody who's offended by it, I apologize. But I wanted to show what it actually involved. Because otherwise people talk about spinal taps, they talk about lumbar punctures, and they don't actually necessarily know what it means. And to be honest, also, if you've had it, you don't want to know what it means, because it's in your back and you can't see it. So it's basically putting a needle in at the base of the spine. It's below where the spinal cord ends, so you're putting the needle into a bag of fluid and drops of clear fluid that look supposed to look like gin, but to me just look like water, drop into a tube and it's taken off for analysis. It's uncomfortable. The worst bit in my experience when I've been doing them is when patients um, have the local anaesthetic put in. Having one done is much worse in casualty than an emergency when someone's got suspected meningitis than it is when it's all being done in a lot more calm fashion in... Um, in a unit where they're done every day for diagnostic reasons. So, and it gives us an idea of what's going on around the brain, because that fluid at the base of the spine is the same fluid that is bathing the brain and that you saw in those black areas on the MRI scan. It's the same stuff. So it's telling us about what's going on around the brain, and when we analyze it, it gives us an idea of whether someone has amyloid deposition in their brain. So it's a surrogate for seeing amyloid and tau and for post-mortem examination, it's, and a very good one. And it's been used clinically for at least 15 to 20 years now. But of course, it's not a very nice thing to have a needle put in you. It doesn't sound very nice. And when I bring it up, even though I say, look, it's, it's okay on the whole. It's still uncomfortable. Any time you put a needle into someone, it can result in infection or local bleeding or complications. And a fifth of people who have one 
roughly get a headache for a couple of days afterwards as well. So it's by no means perfect. And also, in our experience, if you don't have the lab in your hospital where you work, the process of putting it into the right tube, getting it at the right temperature, transporting it to the place where it needs to be analysed can result in inaccuracies. And if you've gone to the trouble of having this done to yourself, if you've gone to the trouble of sort of helping your relative go through this, and if you've gone to the trouble of arranging it and persuading a patient to do it so you'll get a diagnosis, and then you get an inaccurate result after two months, then it's very distressing and upsetting. So whenever this is done, it has to be done properly in a centre which does them regularly, and we can rely on the results. So this processing and assay stability is critical. So when it's done properly, it's very reliable and very helpful, but if it's done haphazardly at all, it can be very distressing and upsetting, and it's understandably enraging for patients and their carers to hear, oh, we didn't get a proper result. Would you like to have it done again? And then we come on to amyloid PET imaging, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So I've told you about glucose PET imaging, which is about metabolism. And so these are FDG PETs, the glucose PETs that I mentioned earlier. But around 15 years ago in Pittsburgh, some researchers developed a chemical, a radioactive one called PIB, Pittsburgh compound B, that would stick to the amyloid in someone's brain. So you could inject it after producing it, and then you could wait a while, and then you could do a scan, and then you could visualize this protein that causes Alzheimer's disease. So this is what I'm going to refer to as amyloid PET throughout. And at the time when this was done, 2004, these compounds could only be made in cyclotrons. They were very unstable compounds that could only be made in specialist facilities. And so you could only really do them in research centers. Since then, companies have made much more stable carbon-based versions rather than the fluorine that can be transported to centers, for instance, throughout the UK. So this sort of scan can be done on a much more routine basis without the need for that cyclotron. And it's been reliably shown over and over again that the substance sticks to amyloid reliably and it gives us an idea of when there are Alzheimer's changes in the brain that are the ones that we'd see if we were to do a microscopic examination of the brain tissue. So that's amyloid PET imaging. And it's taken off in research. In research throughout the world, these are just a few of the studies that I spent a minute and a half looking for and put them up there. And in research, it's being used to see when amyloid occurs, how it affects what happens to someone, and we think that, from what Robin was saying as well, maybe 15, 10, 15 years before someone has symptoms, we start to see amyloid on the, in their brains. And that can be seen with these PET scans. So more and more research is being done to see uh, how it influences cognitive impairment, when atrophy starts, and also, of course, if we treat these individuals whether it stops the progression of Alzheimer's changes and cognitive problems. And these are some of those studies. But I'm going to talk to you about clinical amyloid PET imaging. And so this is Charing Cross Hospital. In uh, almost 20 years of working there on and off, this is the most glamorous photo that I could take of it. So I apologize, that's as good as it's going to look, I'm afraid. And up till 2013, I think, we would use the combination that I described earlier. Of course, we'd stress the history, we'd do an examination, we'd do that brief cognitive testing I described to you, but then we'd request an MRI scan in everyone, we'd do neuropsychological testing for two or three hours, can I get that, yeah, there. And then sometimes when necessary, we'd also organize a lumbar puncture with all the attendant failings that I described to you as well. And then in 2013, my colleagues, Adam Waldman, who's now a professor in Edinburgh, Richard Perry, who's still a consultant with me now, and Zani Wynn, who's a nuclear medicine physician and radiologist, and myself, we started to have the availability to do amyloid PET scans on the NHS. So our trust would pay for them, and we would request them. Now, this is not just that simple as I'd sit in clinic and say amyloid PET for each patient I saw. What we have is a, a set of internationally approved appropriate use criteria. So the patients that have these scans 
have to be either younger than usual, or they have to have an atypical presentation, something uncommon, or there may be some other factor, some other condition that makes it difficult to interpret whether or not they may have Alzheimer's disease. So let's say these might be people who are in their 50s, 60s, 40s, or they may have predominantly visual problems that affect the back of the brain rather than memory, or they may have another condition. They may have something like multiple sclerosis. They may have had a brain tumour which required radiation therapy. And each of these things makes it difficult to determine what exactly is causing their cognitive problems and could it be Alzheimer's disease. And so we started to have a meeting every fortnight, which still happens every other Friday, where we discuss individual patients and decide whether or not they should go ahead for an amyloid PET scan. And these are the sorts of pictures you see in press releases. I myself have approved a press release with a picture like this discussing amyloid PET. They're very bright, they're very exciting. Everybody goes, woo, aren't these scans nice? This is the reality, and this is what my colleagues look at and have to interpret and you can see that it's not quite as clear-cut as it might be. So this is a positive scan. It is someone who has the changes of Alzheimer's disease. And the reason it is a positive scan is that you can't really make out those fibres that are next to the fluid-filled ventricles. You can't make them out spreading. It seems a, a mix of greys, really, but there's no clear-cut spreading fibres going out from the ventricles. Can you see that? It's quite tricky. You might require the eye of faith a little bit. Whereas this is a negative scan. This is someone who doesn't have Alzheimer's changes. And here you can see the shape of the white, the so-called white matter that's black on the scan, confusingly. But can you see how the shape is delineated there? It's clearer to make out, whereas there it's not. So that's how the scan is interpreted. It's not perfect. It's not easy. And these are exemplar scans that are very clear. So the ones that are tricky are much harder to uh, differentiate than this. And just the go through, the positive scan has been likened to a tree in bloom because you can't make out the individual branches of the white matter, whereas the negative scan, the one without Alzheimer's changes, is like a branching tree where there are no leaves. So you can see the individual branches, whether you're looking at a slice like this, here and here, or you're looking at a slice like this, in the same plane as the face. Here you can see the branches, here you can't. So that's the sort of picture that my colleagues look at and that we all look at when we're interpreting the scans. And I don't want to go, th if I was giving this uh, presentation to lots and lots of clinicians and saying why it's useful. I go through case after case after case. But I just want to give you an indication of where it might be useful and what, it might, what might occur when we do it. So this is someone who'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and came to our clinic looking for a second opinion. With the history that suggested that there hadn't been much decline, and with this person's function, that they could still do a lot of the things that they used to do in daily life, we thought with the patient and their carers that it might be useful to get this scan and see if the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was correct. And when we did the scan, it was negative, providing strong evidence that there was no underlying Alzheimer's disease. And as you can imagine, making a big difference to this patient's life, to their prognosis, and to how they felt about life going forward. So that's a negative scan. This is an individual who had had memory problems and thinking problems for seven years. That's how long ago they'd first gone to a clinic. They'd initially been diagnosed with depression, treated with antidepressants. Then they'd been told that there probably wasn't much wrong, but they just were finding things more and more difficult year after year. But they were young, they were young, they were under 65. And we went on to, again, after discussing the scan with them and their relatives, request one, and they had a positive scan, confirming the diagnosis of Alzheimer's that we'd suspected. So that was what was causing their problems, rather than the depression that had been suspected. And we were able to give this person a diagnosis and explain what was causing these problems to her family. And so we went on, this is two years ago now, to look at the impact of what we were doing. So we've done more amyloid PET scans than anywhere else in the country. We're one of the leading un units in Europe 
for this sort of thing in clinical practice, so not in research. No consent forms required, no added research expenditure required. This is about daily or weekly or monthly clinical practice. And what's important is out of our first 100 patients, 23 had a positive amyloid scan, but someone in the previous year or two had said their MRI scan was normal. Okay? So MRI scans aren't perfect by any means. 12 patients who had a report of their MRI scan saying that there were changes suggestive of Alzheimer's disease had a negative amyloid PET scan. And in 42, so less than half, but quite a lot, it changed the management of the patient. So either they started standard Alzheimer's drugs or they went into appropriate trials or they stopped drugs and stopped management for Alzheimer's disease. So it did change what happened for people. It wasn't just a question of us being able to say, oh, it's something different, and then they walk away. What happened to them, what they were able to take, what they were able to take part in changed because of what we did. And so we've now scanned nearly 400 patients, and we've got funding to actually do blinded MRI analysis, so ask our radiologists to look at the MRI scans without knowing what the answer of the amyloid PET scan is, and then just tell us, what do you think, what do you think, and compare the two. We'll also go to all the patients whom we've scanned before and, if possible, find out exactly what's happened to them and see and check that everything is consistent with our results so far. And then we'll get a formal database going forward so we can interrogate how useful this is. And really, you know, I, I'm wary of saying this, but it is important, how cost-effective it is. Does it make a difference? Is it worth it to be spending the NHS's money on tests like these? And should it be used in a much more widespread fashion or limited to very specialist centres as it is now? And our results so far suggest that the scans reduce time to diagnosis and reduce the number of tests we need to do but we do need to work out how much it should be used in the real world. And the current NICE guidelines that we got, as neurologists, we got the chance to look at these, I can't remember, a few months ago, and there was nothing about amyloid PET, and then there was a bit about lumbar puncture, but very little. So at least the next set, if we have a data set that tells us about cost effectiveness, about time to diagnosis, about change to management, in the NHS, without any research involvement, then it makes a difference, and it'll make a difference to NICE guidelines going forward. Now, I'm very proud of our study with our 100 patients, but of course other places do things bigger and better. So in the United States over the last few years, they've done a study with around 10,000 patients across the country. It is a research study where physicians were given the opportunity to refer their uh, patients for amyloid PET scanning if they fitted those criteria that I mentioned to you before. And even in this much larger scale, you can see that the changes are not that different, except that they're even bigger. So management changed in 60% of people with mild cognitive impairment, where memory mainly was affected, and 63% of patients with dementia. And they were the same sort of management changes, drug therapy, counselling about prognosis, and also referral to trials and future planning. So even on that larger scale, we can see that it does affect what happens to people and their families. But I said I'd try to be honest at the start of the talk, so I will continue to, I hope. It's expensive. It's at least a thousand pounds. But you may say, if we have to wait for another couple of years to get a diagnosis, if someone's got a wrong diagnosis, it should be worth that. It'll probably get cheaper. It's not something that should be used on its own. We're using it in conjunction with seeing a patient, spending time with them, the other investigations, and working out what's wrong. If these were just suddenly thrown out at everyone with suspected cognitive impairment, especially as people get older, it starts to get, uh, what we do is start to pick up sort of incidental Alzheimer's that may not be the actual cause of someone's problems. And like the MRI scans, they're not always easy to interpret. So it's not just a yes or no. Those ones I showed you were relatively clear cut, but there are some scans that it's not so clear cut and it requires a little more thought, patience, and even then you may not be able to say definitively one way or the other whether it's positive or negative. So I've talked about amyloid PET, I've talked about what we do now. 
I just wanted to say a bit more about the future. As I said, in 10 years' time, everything will be different because things seem to change that fast. I spoke about two proteins, and so did Robin beforehand. There's amyloid outside the cells, the plaques, and then there's tau tangles within the cells as well. And of course, people have developed tau traces that stick to tau in the brain. And that tells us something slightly different. It tells us that A, amyloid seems to come first, as I mentioned earlier, but tau seems to be the thing that relates to symptoms much better. So amyloid seems to be widespread throughout the brain. But it's the tau that seems to be linked to those areas that are underactive metabolically, that I showed you that took up less glucose. And it's the tau that seems to link directly to symptoms. So if there's a language problem on the left side of the brain, there seems to be more tau on the left side of the brain. If there's a visual problem at the back of the brain, there seems to be more tau at the back of the brain, whereas the amyloid is much more widespread and not so localized. So it looks like tau, which comes after amyloid, is more related to symptom onset and symptom constellation, what syndrome someone has. So although it may not be used as much diagnostically, it will tell us far more about the process of how people develop thinking problems and what thinking problems those people have. And this, this is from this week, I'm proud to say, that this is, this is research showing that blood tests are getting increasingly good at telling us whether someone has risk for Alzheimer's disease. And very, very good indeed if you combine them with blood tests for genetic testing. So if you do blood tests looking at amyloid-related proteins and brain degeneration-related proteins, just from a simple blood test, you can have a better idea of whether someone's likely to have underlying Alzheimer's disease or not. It's very unlikely that these will be used on their own, but they could be used as screening before someone goes on to have all the other tests that I mentioned. So although I'm telling you about amyloid PET now as if it's the next big thing, it's wonderful, etc., but in five or ten years' time, I fully expect that blood tests will come before that and will inform our decision about whether to go on to do an amyloid PET, which is associated with radiation and risk from radiation, whereas blood tests, of course, are not. So things are constantly changing, and it's worth keeping that in mind, too. Right. I couldn't find... I, I tried to make a picture of this, and then I found this on the internet. This is apparently a scanner in Japan, which is meant to fail, make children feel better about having a scan. I'll leave you to decide whether or not you'd feel like that. But there are elephants in the room. There are a couple of them. So this is problematic, but it's becoming clearer as well. As we get older, the likelihood of having more than one disease gets greater and greater. If you look at the brain tissue of people who die when they're older, they often have more than just Alzheimer's disease changes. They may have the changes we see associated with Parkinson's type diseases, so-called Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and uh, vascular disease as well. All these things can coexist in individuals in varying combinations. So there's me here saying, oh yes, we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease, we can do this and do that. But life's never that simple, and many people are affected by more than one thing. So at the moment, what we can do is we can talk about what their predominant problem is, but it's likely that people will need tailored regimes of treatments, if we can ever find them, to deal with the multiple problems that they may have. And this is the big elephant in the room. So when I give this talk, sometimes in clinic, people say, why bother if there's no treatment that can stop this or reverse this? And as you can see, as you see in the news, the big trials that we all hope for so much, which have mainly focused on getting rid of amyloid, and some of them, with our type of PET scan, have shown that you can reduce the amount of amyloid in the brain, make no effect on cognition, on thinking, or any effect on quality of life. So nothing's worked yet. So why do you want to bother making a diagnosis? What difference does it make? And that nihilism is there in the clinic and outside Alzheimer's research in general. But the answer is knowledge. It's knowledge for the patients 
their relatives, their carers. It's knowledge to put the right people into the right trials. And I think if you remember the story of that person who's, who'd gone for seven years without a diagnosis and who'd been told that they had depression, then one problem, couldn't get any benefits, couldn't get any help, etc. The knowledge of having the disease is not a small thing. It's a very important thing to know what the problem is and to know that a neurodegenerative condition is there. And I'll be happy to discuss that with everybody afterwards. But I think at the moment it's critical and it's critical in helping us find new treatments. And without it, we'd be completely lost. So, that's all I wanted to talk about, and that's how I wanted to end. This is a list of the people that fund this sort of work and related work. These are my colleagues to prove that it's actually true. These are the people who sit in with, with me on a Friday morning discussing those scans and patients and making a decision. And these are the other people who've helped with this work. And thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paresh. Um, so, we have the opportunity for questions. And again, we have two roving mics. So if you don't want to lift your hand, if you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Oh, yes, we have one. Fantastic. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, with my very limited understanding of the subject you just talked about, I wanted to know, were you actually saying that MRI scans are pretty much useless in this? I, I didn't want to say every, anything was pretty much useless. I said that they have to, I think they have to be, first of all, they should only be looked at in the context of the individual. So you should be thinking about the person in front of you. If the MRI scan fits with the clinical history and presentation, then it's very useful. If it doesn't fit with that person's story and what's happened to them and what their relatives say about them, I tend to trust the story of the patient and their relatives and either do a repeat MRI or think, is there another reason for have someone having MRI changes like that? Because an MRI is a single snapshot at a single moment. So I don't think they're by no means useless. I request an MRI scan on almost every patient I see on the, in the clinic but I just wanted to uh, be clear that they're not perfect, I think is the best way, put, best way I can put it. Is that all right? You, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Um, you noticed, you, you mentioned that the, uh, the scans that were available required great interpretation by trained uh, clinicians. Uh, do you know if there's any move afoot to bring AI into these machines that will sort of hopefully um, not... Im well, yes, to, to improve what's going on. Yes, so there, there absolutely, absolutely there is. And I'm sure Michael will, uh, will agree that every time we see a new grant proposal or any sort of proposal at the moment, it's machine learning and AI to look at imaging. And the results so far suggest that we were talking about MRI scans just now and whether they were useless or not, that if you use AI to look at, you know, think hundreds of features within a scan, they can provide further information as well. But again, keeping in mind the context of the patient, etc. But yes, very much so. Thank you for a lovely talk. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, in, in your experience, um, the findings on PET scan on uh, people or patients with uh, CBD, PSP, and, and um, Parkinson's disease, is there any substantial difference? Or? Do you mean amyloid, so amyloid PET scans or any PET scans? Any PET scans. Any PET yeah, scans. Yeah. yeah, so we use the FDG PET scans quite a bit to look for under-metabolism in all those groups. So depending on what technology is available in any clinic and everybody's experience with that technology, they have a slightly different algorithm or route to where they get, but often certainly in our practice, in all those three groups, unless the clinical, clinical picture is absolutely typical, 
and the MRI scan is absolutely typical as well, we may go on to do an FDG PET scan to look at areas of reduced metabolism in those individuals. Thank you. Something to do on that side. <laughs> so I think one thing is we always talk about, you know, when does a patient become a patient? So, would you, what's your opinion on screening people potentially? Is this something which should be done? And what would you use, or how useful is this? So I think it's very important that we understand the disease process by using these scans on a research basis. The majority of those research projects, as you know, don't tell people what those scan results are because we don't really know what they mean in well people. And until we have a treatment that works, screening doesn't seem to make sense. Mm. But although there's failure after failure after failure, at some point a treatment will work and then it will be important to have a system in place so that the people who need that treatment are treated fairly, equally, and at the right time. So it will happen at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. We have another question. Dr. Resch? No? Well, then, let's just thank him again, quickly. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before you head off, I just want to uh, give you to. So first of all, thank you very much again for coming to our event, which is fantastic. Don't forget the feedback forms. We will have people at the exits who will collect them. Also, don't forget to validate your car token. Very important at the desk, so you don't have to pay for your parking. So that's really good. Just saying, the next open forum, so our smaller meeting, will be in September. The date is not yet confirmed because the university doesn't release the rooms until July, unfortunately. So we can't decide on the actual. But we have Professor David Wright from the School of Pharmacy, and he's an expert in what's called polypharmacy. So people taking multiple medication. And we know, of course, that loads of older people take multiple medications. And he has done a lot of research in this. So we will have. He has a particular looking at putting pharmacists who can prescribe into care homes, how medicines are managed, is it a good idea? He will talk about that in September. And um, thank you again for coming, and please come back, and thank you again for our speakers. Thank you.